Welcome to our next study in the book of Revelation. I'm Clyde Moyer. I'm the associate pastor here at Clifford Baptist Church in Central Virginia. Uh, pray, uh, praise the Lord for the opportunity to talk about his word, and I'm grateful that you tuned in. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into our lesson. Father God, thank you for the wonderful opportunity we have, Lord, to share with each other by way of live stream. Father, it is an amazing thing to me to be able to stand in the privacy of my office and be speaking with people could possibly be anywhere in the world. Lord, I pray especially for the people that will listen. Help them to hear what they need to hear. Uh, let the Holy Spirit teach them and correct any error that I may make. Father, whatever their needs are, I pray that they would be met through hearing your word, and I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're starting this week in the uh, book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, and those verses read like this. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This is without doubt one of the most awe-inspiring statements in the word of God. If any man is a thrice-readed invitation to the ear of anyone to hear the word of God at any time in any age. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Uh, if any man hath an ear, let him hear. That's talking about free will. It is pointing out the fact that you're welcome to listen if you want. You're welcome to come to Christ if you want, but nobody's going to make you do that. And as always, there are definitely people who have no interest in listening or thinking about it. Uh, in fact, if you go out and try to witness to someone, many times uh, they, are, they may be polite or they may be rude, but they just don't have any interest in it. If they've got most of what they need and uh, they're doing the things that they want to do, that's all they care about. And that's really a scary thought because there is another reality coming, even if these people don't realize it. Uh, the verse says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Uh, now, this is not for you and I, the, where, who John is talking to, or who John is speaking to are the saints who will be in the world during the Great Tribulation. Remember that during the Tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be the world dictator. Men won't be able to buy or sell them unless they do what he says that he wants them to do. If they don't cooperate with him, they will not be able to buy, sell, travel as they please. He's going to rule the world in a way no other dictator has ever done. God is saying to his own, don't resist him. This is the patience and the faith of the saints at that time. If you are in the world during the Great Tribulation, then you're going to have to bear with patience everything that's going on, some of which will be affecting God's children. God will apparently withdraw the Holy Spirit from the world and allow Satan free reign for that period of time. Now today, uh, that's not how it is. The Holy Spirit is holding back Satan and not allowing him to do but so much. But during the Great Tribulation, that's not going to be true. Uh, the devil and his minions of evil and lost mankind will never be able to say to God, you never gave us a chance to prove we were right because the Great Tribulation is precisely that, a time where Satan and lost people will be running everything and they have their shot at proving that they can do what they, they say they can do. Now, the first beast is a political leader, a political power and person, and his power will be worldwide. And now we're coming to talk a little bit about the second wild beast, and this is the one who comes to earth as a religious leader. Verse 13, 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake of the dragon. The wild beast is very clear who he is when he appears. Uh, when the Bible speaks of the sea or the seas, or the, this man rising up out of the seas, it's talking about the different peoples of the world. Um, basically, it's assumed that this beast will rise out of Israel. Now, that's an assumption, but a lot of people do agree that that's what's going to happen. This guy will be a messiah, and Israel wouldn't accept a false messiah 
even if unless it came from their own land. In fact, they didn't accept the true Messiah when he was here. He had two horns like a lamb, and this is the indication of his imitation of Christ. The first beast is opposed to Christ, and he is Antichrist. The second beast imitates him. We're starting with a little bit of an overlap with last week's where we finished in order to have a continuity of thought. We ended up at a kind of an awkward place to stop. Uh, this second beast is also considered Antichrist, which means he's posing instead of Christ. Uh, he imitates Christ, uh, but this pseudo lamb does not subtract sin. He adds and multiplies it to the world. He is truly the opposite, uh, opposite result of Jesus. Jesus paid the price for sin. This false Messiah will be encouraging sin. Uh, he doesn't come to do his own will, but the will of the, the beast in the same, or the Antichrist, the same way that Christ didn't come to do his own will, he came to do the will of the Father. This is a counterfeit Christ in every way, shape, or form. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they will deceive the very elect and this is exactly what we're going to see happening. The false prophet will be similar to John the Baptist. John the Baptist came to prepare the way of the Lord. The false prophet will prepare the way for the Antichrist. Uh, verse 12 says, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now the second wild beast uh, has a delegated authority from the first wild beast, which actually makes him subservient to the, the first beast, also the Antichrist. But he's on a par with him as well because he has the same powers, some of them. This second wild beast leads in a movement to get rid of the harlot of Revelation 17, which is the false church that will go into the Great Tribulation. Uh, John doesn't even dignify that church by calling it a church. He calls it a harlot. That's pretty blunt speaking there. The true church, which is us, will have already left the earth. We're called the bride of Christ. But here, the, what's left on earth once Christ raptures his true church out is the apostate church. Now, what is an apostate church? An apostate church is a church that doesn't preach the gospel. It goes along with worldwide trends. It goes along with things like abortion or socialism or, or things like that. It goes along with things that don't believe in God. It will be uh, fine to say, well, it's okay if you're gay or if you're, you're a drunkard or if you are a thief or whatever. Uh, it's no big deal. We'll accept you and we love you like you are. That's the apostate church. The true church loves all people as well, but the thing that they do is they try to help these people see the error of their ways so that they can be redeemed by Christ and go to heaven when they pass away, not the apostate church. Uh, here you're going to see the last vestiges of the church, and the false prophet will offer them something new to worship. Instead of Jesus, he'll offer them the last world dictator. Uh, this is presented to us as a, the terrible second beast who will exalt the first beast to the place of authority and worship. Uh, the, the verses we read a moment ago said, whose wound of death is healed. This is going to be the big lie or the strong delusion that's going to come to the world. Uh, let's look at Revelation 13, verses 13 through 14. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did not live. Uh, the false prophet is going to be a worker of signs and miracles. Satan works signs and miracles even now. Uh, the Lord warned against this false prophet. Uh, uh, his deception is that he, he copies Elijah in bringing fire down from heaven. I mean, you, you see every step of the way, the Antichrist and the false prophet, the things that they're doing mimic uh, a previous genuine uh, miracle, and they follow with a false one trying to get people to follow them. So this beast in the end times will have satanic power. There is no question about that. Uh, the world is deceived completely by this. 
uh, with the exception of God's elect, because we that belong to God cannot be deceived because the Holy Spirit lives in us and explains to us what we're seeing, whether it's true or not. The false prophet will really tip his hand uh, by causing an image to be made of the man of sin, basically a huge statue of some kind, a likeness of the first beast that emphasizes the wound of death that was healed. Now, it's interesting to note that, uh, that Jesus didn't permit anything connected with his physical appearance to survive. Uh, I suspect there's a reason for that. If we knew exactly what Jesus looked like, we'd be end up worshiping pictures and statues of him instead of worshiping Christ himself. There is only one object worthy of worship, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, when ye therefore have seen the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. That's found in Matthew 24th chapter 15th verse. We think, uh, and most people think, that what will be placed in the temple or in the holy place will be the statue of the Antichrist. Let's look at verses 15 through 17. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and, no and that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, just a little side note that has no spiritual benefit, but when it says it gives the uh, power of this image to speak, I can't help but remember a time my wife and I were in New Orleans. She had a work seminar and one of the things that is really common in New Orleans are for folks to dress up and basically paint themselves uh, looking like statues. And they are very realistic. They look exactly like a statue. Uh, I had been walking around town and I stopped and was just taking a rest beside a beautiful wrought iron fence. And right on the corner was a, a beautiful silver statue of a gentleman that looked kind of like Mercury with the winged uh, winged feet and whatnot. And I stood there about five minutes and all of a sudden that statue moved. And I got to tell you, after it moved, I moved too. Uh, I was not expecting that. There's no spiritual benefit in that, but hope it gave you a chuckle anyway. Um, the problem here is that the, the, the beast and the Antichrist are going to require a symbol, a sign put on each person to allow them to do normal daily business. Uh, so this is going to be a strange thing. You're going to have an idol that talks uh, and speaks to, other, to people. It's going to be something that causes the whole world to turn and worship the beast. Um, you can see how the Antichrist is now wedding or marrying religion and business together because you have to have the mark to do the business. In John's day, many times soldiers were branded by their commanders and slaves were branded by their masters. It was to give clear identification as to who you belong to. Uh, and these also were attached to certain pagan temples where the mark of the god or goddess was branded onto your body. Uh, a gentleman named Ptolemy Philopater had all the Jews in Alexandria marked with the ivy leaf, leaf which was the symbol of Dionysius. Uh, this is something that is a scary thought, especially in today's world when we're hearing much talk about the suggestion that every human being be implanted with a tiny rice-sized microchip that will have all of our personal information on it, our bank account, our medical records. And they use things to say how beneficial this would be by saying, what if you're in a car crash and you're unconscious and you're allergic to something and nobody's there to tell them? If you have this chip, they can just scan the chip in your wrist or wherever it is, and all the information will be there. The people that, that push this, though, don't discuss the fact that if you are all in the computer with everything that you've got, with the stroke of a key, you can forbid somebody from doing business or getting to their money or anything else. Uh, can you clearly see the relationship there with what we're reading? I'm not suggesting necessarily that this chip 
microchip is the mark of the beast, but it could be because it jives with what seems to be going to happen. The scripture tells us it's going to be going on in the, in the great tribulation. Now, J. Vernon says, and remember, this is a J. Vernon McGee study. J. Vernon says that he doesn't think the chip is the fulfillment of prophecy, but it certainly shows how the prophecy could come to pass. What's the mark of the beast? God didn't tell us. Why didn't God tell us? I honestly don't know other than it, the only reason I can think of is possibly to keep us following him in faith and not by sight. Moving along to verse 18, the, the Bible says, Here is wisdom. Let him that understand, with understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Here is wisdom seems to be kind of an ironical declaration when we consider the maze of speculation that has been accumulated about this, this, uh, ver this uh, number, 666. Uh, in the Greek, uh, there is a very beautiful arrangement of this number. 600 is the word hexakazoi, 60 is hexakanta, and 6 is hex. Uh, the numerical value attached to each letter is there, but basically we just have to leave it there. We really don't know what it means. Um, there's lots of speculation. I'm sure you can find many, many books in your local library that deal with what that number means, but we just don't really have an understanding of that. Uh, J. Vernon suggests we not waste time trying to figure it out or identify a person. Uh, instead, he says we need to present Jesus Christ in order to, with the gospel to reduce the number of people that are deceived by this. The only positive and important item for us today to consider is the first beast is, the beast is a man. And this teaches us not to trust man. I want to read a couple of verses here from somewhere else in the Bible that go along with what we're talking about. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. We are not to trust in man. Now we're gonna move into chapter 14 for just a little bit before we close this particular study. Uh, chapter 14 contains several different events. It's an interlude in which we see the Lamb on Mount Zion, Jesus on Mount Zion, and we hear the proclamation of every, everlasting gospel. We will also hear the pronouncement of judgment upon Babylon and upon all of those that received the mark of the beast. And we will also hear praise for those who die in the Lord, and we will hear the preview of the Battle of Armageddon. That's a whole lot. This chapter is going to constitute a hiatus in the series of the seven performers that we've been working through. It's obvious that this interlude couldn't be fitted between the sixth and seventh performers who are the two wild beasts. Uh, and uh, the two wild beasts uh, have to be considered together. They're pretty much like Siamese twins with just different job descriptions. So separating them would be very difficult, if not impossible. Therefore, this interlude follows the seventh performer in recognition of the logical sequence of the book, which is not a hodgepodge of visions, but unfolds in a logical, chronological, and mathematical order. The book of Revelation actually follows a very specific order. Now, we're going to have to stop right here for this week. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the folks that have tuned in. Bless them, Lord. I pray for their situation, whatever it is. I ask, Lord, that something about the word that we've studied will touch their hearts right in the need that they have. Father, if people are in physical danger, bless them and protect them and keep them safe. If they need guidance, Father, give them wisdom. If they need removal of fear, give them peace. And Lord, I ask for physical healing for those that need it. 
We thank you for this in Christ's precious name. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you next week.